Right. So, this will be a slightly historical talk as well, with a little bit of vague reference to research, which very occasionally I get to look at. Um, but those who have known me for a long time know that my background is with bryophytes, specifically in mosses, but um, as I might get time to mention later, um, a little broader than that sometimes. So, as I found out when I started back in 1980 getting interested in these things called mosses, thanks to a lady whose photograph you've just seen, one Elise Williston, who was my um, lecturer at that stage, in 1979 actually, um, <clears throat> I found them quite fascinating, but I also rapidly found that when I said to somebody, or sometimes my mother said to one of her friends, oh, my son's working on mosses, and they said, oh, you mean there's more than one? <laughs> and then when my mother elaborated and said, oh, yes, he works on arid mosses, and they just looked very strange and blank at that point. And then sometimes she would say somewhat later that I worked in the herbarium, and they said, oh, what's that? <coughs> So I decided that perhaps I should give you a slightly short version of a Botany 3 lecture and explain what bryophytes are. A lot of people don't know what even the term bryology means. It's the study of bryophytes. Now that's a bit confusing in some ways if you've heard of bryozoans because it all comes from the Greek bryon for moss, which so bryophytes are moss plants and bryozoans <coughs> are moss animals. And there's a bryozoan picture from the uh, early 1900s over on the right there. Bryophytes, um, is a, is a, it's not one group, it's, it's actually divisible into three groups. They were formally divide, uh, treated as a single division, but they're now split into three groups, the mosses, the liverworts and the homeworts, um, of which there are about 23,000 described species worldwide. That, in context, is rather tiny. If you look at um, flowering plants, there's, the estimates are something like about 150,000 species, and then if you wonder why Pam ran out of time yesterday, that's because she deals with something which nobody knows how the estimates are, but could be anything up to the latest estimates of possibly 5.1 million species. Um, obviously, we don't know anywhere near that quantity of species of fungi. So, bryophytes, very ancient group of plants. They diverged before the flowering plants and the other land plants and before, and before the continent separated, which means that we're finding more and more that there are groups and, in fact, even species which are common to either the whole world or through the, the southern hemisphere, for instance. So, endemism is not nearly so large a thing as it is with flowering plants. Uh, it also causes certain difficulties for a moss taxonomist like me because if I decide I think something might be a new species, I probably have to run off and look at all the literature from New Zealand, South Africa, South America, if I can find some of that, and if it exists, um, to see whether they also have the same thing and somebody in the 19th century called it a different name, which is one of the reasons why some of our moss names change. <clears throat> So the precise relationships are still problematic, but mosses seem to be more closely related to the vascular plants than to either of the other bryophyte groups, hence why they're no longer treated as one group. They're all linked by the dominant generation being the gametophyte generation, unlike flowering plants where it's the reverse, and they normally bear an unbranched parasitic sporophyte. So the sporophyte generation is not a separate generation, it's entirely dependent on the gametophyte generation. So the major lineages, the mosses, um, which some of us find much more interesting. No, shut up, Graham. <coughs> <laughs> They're found in almost all environments, but commonest and most diverse in the arid regions, which is one of the reasons I find them interesting. Um, they consist of perennial and ephemeral species. The, you, you get this throughout the groups where there are some forms that are perennial and will have put effort into, and I was interested in some, one of the talks yesterday where they were talking about um, waxes on plants. Now, um, most people don't know this. I did some work back in... 1980 on my honours year where, where uh, it was a bit common to look at things like mosses with uh, waxes on their leaves then and uh, if you look back into enough literature you'll find some SEM photographs of those. <coughs> um, so uh, that's their way of protecting themselves and, and, and they can be referred to as resurrection plants and you can see one of the arid um, mosses which is common in South Australia here, that's in its dry state, this is one, you, when it becomes wet. <coughs> 
Um, <clears throat> there are apocryphal stories of bryophytes being able to regenerate after 50 years in herbarium storage. That really depends how they've been stored and, and in what way. Um, various different sorts of mosses. There are Acrocarpus ones where the sporophyte is born terminally and Pleurocarpus ones where it's born laterally. The hornworts um, generally not so well known in this part of the world because there's probably very few places you find them regularly. They're all, they need a lot of water around, very uncommon in the arid regions. Um, there are again some perennial species, the ones we have here are not, and they have an indeterminate sporophyte, so they have this long horn-like sporophyte which starts splitting from the apex and releasing its spores that way. The other main liverworts, and they're quite diverse and not so much in this part of the world, we have less of them than, than in the likes of the tropics or in the cool temperate rainforests of Tasmania where Gintris would see lots of them. Um, <clears throat> again, perennial and ephemeral species, that they're also leafy and sallows types. Most of you are probably familiar with seeing this beastie on um, suburban footpaths or, or um, places like Waterfall Gully around Adelaide where it's a bit wetter. Um, if you can see, it has a half moon shaped gamma cup um, hence its name, Lunularia, Marcantia over here, the um, one of which that division is named. Asterella at the top was a very different type of sporophyte. And then there are other groups which have um, leaf-like structures. Mosses, of course, uh, bryophytes don't have true leaves. <coughs> very ecologically important group in Australia, even though that's not always recognised. People tend to think of them as things that grow in these lovely wet spots and you get nice patches of lovely mosses on Pine Marsh Falls there. But they're actually, um, in some cases, dominant after fires. Um, remember after Ash Wednesday up on Mount Lofty, it was an absolute forest of Marcantia berteroana and Funeria hygrometrica and a few other things. Um, <clears throat> but they are increase, it increase, it's increasingly known how important they are in, in arid Australia and there you see a guy who is um, quite well known amongst those of us who have an interest in arid soil crusts, a guy called David Eldridge who works out at Macquarie University who's made quite a study of arid soil crusts and um, those are in South Australia particularly dominant and um, are dominated by a, a mixture of lichens and mosses. History of bryophyte research in South Australia is very limited, I'm here to say. <clears throat> as far as I've been able to establish, there were no collections of mosses, certainly none that seem to be extant, that I can find um, collected in South Australia before Mueller's time. The early exploring expeditions like Brown on the Flinders expedition and so on don't seem to have collected any mosses in South Australia. They did in other states, so we have earlier records from um, the likes of Drummond in Western Australia in the, 18th, in the 19th century um, and plenty of collections from the eastern states um, but basically nothing from here until um, Mueller appeared in 1847 and as far as we know, or as far as I'm able to find, there's about 110 specimens that he collected in South Australia which are now sitting in Melbourne Herbarium because of course he went to Melbourne and became the government botanist there. <coughs> he was the first... Um, person to have his specimens documented also, and Mueller and Hamper, um, not the same Mueller, a different one, Carl Mueller in Europe, um, who was notorious for publishing more names than anybody else and causing us all sorts of issues. <coughs> um, so yes, and then Ralph Tate collected a few things, Otto Tepper likewise uh, collected a few things um, and sent them on to Mueller in Melbourne, um, so there's about 100 of his specimens sitting in Melbourne Herbarium also. Um, <clears throat> basically after that period it seems like virtually nothing happened. There might have been the odd person collecting a moss, moss specimen here or there but virtually nothing and certainly nobody seriously working on them. And that's reasonably common to Australia to be honest. Um, after the end of the 19th century flourishing of all those people I've got listed up there really nothing much happened until Jim Willis turned up in the 1940s in Melbourne Herbarium and got interested in mosses and, and did some publications and some really good work um, and that included some, uh, some papers which involved South Australian material. Um, he encouraged other people to, to uh, work on them and uh, Noel Lothian in fact published a paper in 1955 listing 17 moss species that he'd collected and had identified by Willis. 
<clears throat> there's another little, little sideline story that I thought I might bring up too. There's the, if you want to have a look into it, it's quite fascinating. There was a, a flowering plant published called Trianthema humilima, which was recorded and published by Mueller as the smallest known flowering plant in the Azoaceae. Only trouble was it wasn't. And Willis in 1950 actually um, got through to J.M. Black that um, this is actually one of the larger mosses and it has a very open moss capture which looks a bit like Azoaceae. But... Then, uh, just after Jim Willis got interested, we had the advent of somebody, yes, same name as this fungal lady. <laughs> I think there might be a relationship somewhere there. Um, so, yes, um, Pam's father-in-law, David Catcherside, um, came to Australia to start the first genetics department at Adelaide University in 1952, but he'd, since his quite early days, um, I think in his, his early teens, I think he, he told me, um, had joined the British Biological Society and had a lot of involvement with that, and it became his lifelong hobby, despite being a very prominent and very um, erudite um, geneticist. Um, some of you who did genetics in the old days might remember his Genetics of Recombination, which was a textbook we used. <clears throat> he set about rapidly collecting things here and found at least 45 new records within the short few years he lived here at that stage. And he inspired a number of others to do collecting for him. David Simon was one of those, and especially Lindy Williams. And we've got something like 3,000 odd collections, as you see, of Lynn Williams here in our collections, um, the depths of which still haven't been plumbed. Um, then, um, because his family had settled here after his earlier uh, foray to Australia, David actually went back to, to Britain after he was here and has been in Birmingham for a long time and then in Canberra. He retired to Adelaide much later and set about documenting the mosses properly and his 1980 handbook came out um, and that was only soon after Scott and Stone's book on mosses of southern Australia and that was really a, a turning point where we suddenly had something we could work with in, in Australia because prior to that, people working on mosses and liverworts and things had to go back to either Bentham or to um, material that had come out from New Zealand, which was the closest we, we had to anything to identify anything in South Australia. Um, unfortunately, David's matching handbook on liverworts never got finalised. There's some drafts towards that. But he was very good to leave us his specimens of his herbarium, which are will be worked on for generations to come in the herbarium. After that, um, 1950s, when David first came to, to South Australia, there were a number of others who worked, and, and the advent of Eichler in the herbarium, who thought more broadly, and, and Lothian and others, and Elise Wollaston in the herbarium, who was teaching, uh, sorry, in the university, who was teaching bryophytes and things, um, encouraged quite a number of other people to do collections. We even very Briefly, as a one-off experiment, um, the Botanic Gardens had a six-month um, research fellowship for a lady, uh, was awarded to a lady called Barbara Tears, who worked on tiny ghasts, these little leafy liverworts that nobody else can identify in the family Lejeuneaceae, which is incredibly diverse, mostly in Queensland. Um, that was 1983. And then um, the modern era of all sorts of books and things which have appeared, but not many people to work on them. Current figures, so I'll skip over a bit because I'm running late as usual. Um, but just to mention that David Catcherside in his 1980 handbook said that it was probably unlikely the, the numbers of species in South Australia would even reach 200 because it's an arid area and all those things. Well, the current list is, is already over 210 um, and it will never get large. Um, if you compare it with other parts of Australia, you'll see we're not exactly diverse, but we're not the lowest. What's still to be done? Well, Peter Copley you heard earlier, and um, that was one bit of, of study that, that came in with some money that was organised for a study of sphagnum in South Australia, which was a uh, threatened species and habitats and so on. Um, there's all sorts of projects I'm trying to do in my spare time somehow and not really succeeding very well, but um, just as a very quick example, Spherocarpus, which is the liverwort, which is not, a, not in my comfort zone, but somewhere there, um, first recorded as an adventive in South Australia by me in 1989, um, not ever published, and I kept looking for it and found that it's actually not uncommon on suburban roadsides, but only turns up in years where the, the um, uh, conditions are right. 
I now have found due to spores that we've actually got two species here, so that's hopefully about to be published after some work with a student just recently. And we have the Australian Bryophyte Workshop here in uh, the Flinders Ranges and in Adelaide in uh, the end of August coming up. So we'll see what we find then with a heap of experts around. Won't worry about that. Thank you to those people.